Witch in Charm's Way, a cozy mystery audio book, written and narrated by R. K. Dreaming. Part 6 Captain Villain didn't try to lead me out of the house. Instead, he led me down into the basement and into the dungeons below the castle and then into a twisty, narrow corridor. I kept looking around in wide-eyed amazement for which Captain Villain had no patience. He stopped at a dead-end wall and told me to press on a brick. To my shock, a section of wall opened up into a passageway hewn into the rocks. Hewn by nature, it seemed. It was a cave tunnel. As we walked, it went down and down and intersected with many other tunnels and twisted to and fro. I felt like at any moment I might bump into the Minotaur. It was dark. I was glad he had suggested I bring a lantern. When I had been a kid, I had heard of tunnels that ran under the cliff, but I had thought they were just a myth. And anyway, even if they had existed, Allegra and I had not wanted to go looking for them because the myth said they led into the catacombs where all of the ancient eldritch crypts were. Gosh, I hoped he wasn't leading me there. Captain Villain trotted along like he was going for a walk in the park. He didn't hesitate, not once. I sure hoped he wasn't going to run off because I didn't know how I would get out of here without him. And I certainly hoped this talking cat thing wasn't a delusion because otherwise I was done for. The cat could disappear off at any moment and I would perish of thirst before I breathed fresh air again. Finally, we saw daylight ahead. The daylight was the end of the tunnel that we were in. It opened up on some rocky ground a little distance up from Kitten Cove. I could see the beach and sea below. I stayed in the shadows at the entrance of the cave mouth and pulled my hood lower over my face. Kitten Cove was named for the many cats and kittens that lived there. They didn't seem to mind the surf and often frolicked in it. Many of them were sprawled out on the sand dunes sunbathing. You knew the cats had to be magical because, even with winter's arrival, this little beach was warmer than it had a right to be. There he is, said Captain Villain. And I saw him. James the werewolf was lying down amongst the cats, apparently fast asleep even though it was past midday. The thing about Kitten Cove was that the cats here guarded their territory fiercely. That was why I had always liked Kitten Cove as a teen. It was a place where I could be fairly solitary, whereas Brimstone Bay Beach had always been so busy. The cats didn't let anyone come here that they didn't like. And if they liked James the werewolf, then chances were that he was not dangerous. And so I found myself yelling, James! Yoo-hoo! Yoo-hoo! said Captain Villain, looking disgusted. What? I shrugged. It's a sound that carries. And I was right, because James had sat up and was looking around to see where I had called him from. I waved my arms and shouted some more until he saw me. He ran over to me and then stopped a short distance away, looking confused. You're the woman from that Castle Café, he said suspiciously. Yep, I'm the woman. What do you want? He was looking at my hands, as if he expected to find my wand there. Sorry about that, I said. I didn't mean it. Heat of the moment, you know. Were you looking for me? he said. He looked more nervous than I felt, which was comforting. This guy couldn't be a killer. My instincts told me it wasn't possible. Ooh, instincts, said Captain Villain. I like it. Shut up, I said. What? said James, looking startled. Nothing, I said, not you. And anyway, it wasn't him, said Captain Villain. He was here all night long, getting drunk and then passing out. I saw him. I blinked. Oh, great. 
There went my only suspect. And it wasn't like I could tell Agent Constantine any of this. He hadn't believed the cat existed. He was hardly going to believe that the cat was an alibi. Listen, you'd better sit down, I said to James. He looked alarmed. Lily, he said immediately. I had implied that I had bad news, and she was the first thing he thought of. I felt sorry for him. He really cared about her. I nodded, and the look on his face made me feel even more sorry for him. What's happened? he asked in a horror-struck voice. I told him as gently as I could. He said, no, no, no. He started pacing. He looked like he was going to run away, as if he thought that he could go and find her and that I could be proven wrong. Don't go, I said quickly. We have to talk. They think you're a suspect. I know that you're innocent. He shook his head with bafflement. Who says I'm a suspect? Why do you think I'm innocent? And then what I had said to him seemed to hit him hard. He sat down on the rocks really fast. They, they think I did it? They think I killed her? His voice broke on that last part. I'm so sorry, I said. I could tell that he had loved her. I had thought they were arguing in anger. But they had been arguing out of love. She had been mad at me for hurting him. She had loved him too in a way. Agent Constantine from the local police is looking for you, I said. I think it might be better if you went to find him rather than running off, because that will only make you look more suspicious. I've got nothing to hide, he said hotly. Good, I said. Will you tell me about her? What was she doing in Brimstone Bay in the first place? He spoke eagerly, as if speaking about Lily was all that he wanted to do. We came here in the summer, months ago, a group of us friends all together. She and I were together then. I thought we were for real. But then she met him. He looked angry. Oberon? I asked. He nodded. Captain Villain had gone to sit next to James's ankles, and James was absent-mindedly stroking him. Captain Villain was purring like it was blissful. How very inappropriate. You mind your own business, he said to me. I gave him a dirty look. James did not notice. He was staring into empty space with a stunned look on his face. She became friends with that Oberon and his group, he said bitterly. And she stopped hanging around with us. We were supposed to only be here for two weeks, but when it was time to go, she said that she was going to stay. And I said to her that her mum and dad and sisters were going to be mad about her staying like that so suddenly, that they'd be worried. His voice trailed off. He looked stricken. They don't know, he said. I nodded. Agent Constantine or Chief Gulliver Rain will call them. I think they'll tell them as kindly as possible. He looked comforted by this. He rubbed his face and didn't say anything for a while. She stayed, but you and your friends all went home, I prompted him. He nodded. I had to go home. I had a job to get back to. She told me she was finished with me, that she liked it here, she was having fun. I thought she would be okay. I might not have liked that Oberon guy, but I guess I was jealous. He and his friends all seem all right, don't they? Posh sorts. He said this last part bitterly. I didn't say anything. I waited for him to continue. It's not fair, he said. They have everything. I guess that's what she liked, you know, the rich people lifestyle. We're just ordinary people back home. She's just an ordinary witch. She said coming to Brimstone Bay felt like coming to Hollywood, so exotic and special. I mean, all the famous witching and eldritch families live here. It was exciting, you know. The Blazes live here, the Westbrims, the Hardwicks, the Rains, the Rexes. I nodded. I didn't tell him I was a Westbrim. I didn't think it would help. 
Why did you come back? I asked him gently. Did you miss her? He nodded. All the time. We were friends before we got together, you know, so she stayed in touch. Every time she messaged me, she told me how much fun she was having. But then the messages changed. I could tell she was keeping something from me. She was really excited about something and she wouldn't tell me what it was. My heart leapt. This had to be it. She had a secret. Could it have been worth killing over? What was it? I asked eagerly. You must have had some kind of idea what it might be. He shrugged. Not really. She wouldn't tell me. I think it had something to do with this guy she was seeing. Oberon? He shook his head. Some other guy, some older guy. I was surprised. What older guy? I asked sharply. He shrugged angrily. I don't know. She wouldn't tell me his name. She wouldn't tell me hardly anything about him. But she liked to rub it in my face. She said he was really special, that he had something extra. She called him a sugar daddy, some rich git. I looked at him thoughtfully. A wealthy older guy. It could have been anyone. The whole town was full of wealthy older guys. I suppose it made sense that if she was looking for love, she would know Oberon wasn't a serious option. It wouldn't matter if he was the nicest guy on the planet. Witches and vampires were not supposed to fall in love. It was taboo. Did she say what this rich guy was? I asked, a wizard? Someone eldritch? He shook his head miserably. Then he stood up abruptly, a fierce look coming onto his face. He bunched his fists tightly. I'm going to find him and when I do, he's going to be sorry. I don't think you should do that, I said quickly. You're damn right he shouldn't do that, said an angry voice. Startled, both of us jumped and looked around. Agent Constantine had appeared from behind a rocky outcrop. He was glaring at the both of us, as if we were conspiring to cover up the murder. I felt my face go bright red, and I knew I looked horribly guilty. I glared at him defiantly. Ever heard of announcing your arrival? You startled us. That was the point, he said coldly. I thought you said you didn't know where James Buckleman was. I didn't, I insisted. Oh, really? He looked down towards my feet. Captain Villain was winding himself around my ankles. Did your cat tell you? He asked acidly. I raised my chin. And what if he did? He scowled. I scowled back. What the heck kind of eldritch was he? He couldn't be working for the Conclave of Magic, or he should have known it was true that some familiars had special powers. He probably thought Captain Villain was my familiar. He probably thought I was being metaphorical about the cat talking to me. Either that, or he thought I was outright lying. I didn't care. Agent Constantine, meet James Buckleman. There, you wanted an introduction and now you've got it. Agent Constantine did not look impressed. You had better tell me what you are doing down here right now, he said. I rolled my eyes. Is it against the law now to come for a walk on the beach? James had sat down on a rocky outcrop again, looking miserable. I thought I had better leave them to it, so I ducked away a few steps deeper into the cave. To my surprise, Chris Constantine came after me and grabbed hold of my arm. I froze, alarmed at his sudden and unexpected proximity. He bent down until his mouth was near my ear. Did you think for a moment that he could be dangerous? He said quietly. Don't you ever do anything like this again? I yanked my arm away from him, scared that he would feel how cold I was to the touch. Shooting him a defiant look that told him I would darn well do what I pleased, I retreated back into the cave. Hi, this is the end. Comment the code word wowzers trousers to confuse everyone who hasn't reached this part of the story yet.
Thanks a lot.